but in other words, that actions met a need beyond him that brought comfort, encouragement, consolation to the work. Now, he was not the only one who sold land. If you, check, if you look at verses 34 and 35, it says, as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and laid them at the apostles' feet. But, but there's something that is unique and different, that was different from his own. I think it's about the size and what was on the land. Now, the word lands, as was used in verse 34, is Korean, the Greek. It's different from the, the word land, which is agros, to describe the one that Barnabas sold. You can check it out. Now, in some translation, the, 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 his own is called field. The word field is used. So agros connotes a, a farmland. You know, some even, uh, uh, the word country, you find the word country there. Sorry, field. Farmland for driving cattle. It suggests that it was not a plot of land because Korean is a plot of land. But he gave uh, a large field or country. We're not told the specific dimension. And he did it. When he did it, he called for them to name him because he brought comfort. He made up for the lack of others. Now, we're told he was a Levite from Cyprus. Now, we don't know if he was from a poor family or not. We don't know if this was all he had or not. It's not about his wealth, but about his heart and about his action. Everybody was told to give. Those that have plots sold them. But he did far more than everyone else. And that reminds me of the widow that brought two mites that the Lord commended as they were coming to give offering. She gave all that she had. She didn't give out of abundance, but all that she had. And she was commended. Now, this man gave a field. And the Bible says it wasn't just one person. All the apostles decided it was unanimous to give him a new name. They had to give him a new name, so name him. They added to his name. They added value to his life. And from that day, he was not the same just because of what he did. I am a son of consolation. Now, a son of consolation is the one who makes up for the lack of others. Not because he's desirous. Now, when I was thinking about, you know, this, this topic, I just thought about the man of God, our dear father, as a true son of consolation. He's always been so. Partnership as we know it now has always been in the ministry. It is the celebration of it and the recognition of it that we are more involved in and aware of now than ever. There's always been partnership. I remember we went um, very many years ago, decades now, went to a certain church, and the minister, if I mention the amount in Naira, some of you might be disappointed, but it had value then. The minister was looking for 1,000 Naira to travel from Lagos to Wari for a conference. And he was raising that in the church. And the man of God was invited as the guest speaker. Of course, nobody raised his hand to give. Today, it will be millions of Naira, the value today. And the man of God just said, don't worry, I'll, I'll, I'll send the money. The whole money, not a part of it. It was big then. And sent the whole money. Because pastor thought, the pastor wants to go for a conference. And he's looking for money to go. That was all expense paid. It wasn't just transport money. 
pastor gave that. That's our man of God, son of consolation. Praise the Lord. He made up for the lack of all, not just others. And I remember the other day when the Benson Idahosa University wanted to confer a degree and then at the, at the investiture to confer a degree on our man of God, Pastor Chris, who went there, the very first place we will go into, they presented all their needs, their biggest needs, and said all the figures, and it runs into hundreds of millions into a billion. And they treated them, and, and, and they, I think they expected if there was going to be any contribution that the man of God could make. He looked at all of them and took the biggest. He took the biggest. The, the VC almost passed out. You know? And uh, they, didn't, they, they didn't believe. <laughs> they didn't believe. The Archbishop said, I, I, Tom, what am I hearing? What am I hearing? I said, he said it. He took the biggest and gave it and did it. That's what it means to be a son of consolation. Making up for the lack of others. Hallelujah. Now, a son of consolation looks at the vision and looks at what needs to be done and identifies with it spirit, soul, and body. It's totally committed to the vision. Now, we have to understand everything we're doing, everything we're doing in the church, in the departments, everything we're doing is all about the vision that God gave to our man of God, Pastor Chris. And the vision is the vision of God giving to his son, a man of God, Pastor Chris, and we have come to be identified with him. And I'm so glad, I always say this in church, many ministries are looking for, they, they're thinking, what is the next level? Some of them think, should I hold a crusade? Should I not? Should I uh, visit the poor? Or should I not? They're thinking of what to do. Should we do, carry out some humanitarian activities? But in this ministry, you have all of them together. The Rhapsody of Realities, the inner city missions for children. Then you have, you have the, the, the books for all ages. Then we have the internet one. We have outreaches where everything you will ever need is here. What a place to be. And you're not going to be thinking, how do I carry out ministry? We're even trying to catch up and to meet, meet up with all the, the, the various partnerships. I like to partner with as many as possible, with every partnership. I like to be part of it because it shows me my relevance. Hallelujah. Praise God. Are you a son of consolation? All right. Now let's look at some of the parts of the Bible. This time around, it's a group. It's a church. 2 Corinthians chapter number 8 from verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit the grace of God bestowed upon the churches of Macedonia. How that in the great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon the fellowship, take upon us the fellowship of ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own service to the Lord and to us by the will of God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now it says, this they did not as we hoped. In other words, it wasn't a demand on them. Not as we expected, but beyond our expectations. They first gave themselves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. This is amazing. They gave themselves to the Lord. That's where it starts from. They gave themselves to the Lord. Now, 
they were in deep poverty. So uh, this church makes me know giving doesn't have to do with whether you have it much or not. It has to do with the value you have for the word of God and your relationship with Jesus Christ. They heard that collections were being made for the poor saints in Jerusalem. They were poor. But he said, they were willing of themselves. And beyond their abilities, they gave joyfully. They were so happy. They were glad to be part of ministering to the poor saints, even though they were poor. Now, this was Paul's testimony of what they did. He was writing about them. It was not what they announced themselves, but Paul's testimony. This can be said of you. It can be said of your cell. It can be said of your outreach. It can be said of your, of your church, your group, your zone, or your region. Now, they gave themselves first to the Lord. When you give yourself first to the Lord, you don't give in half measures. Can this be said of you? Or are you holding back? Are you giving in half measures? You first have to give yourself to the Lord. Paul didn't say they have given themselves to the Lord, but he also added, and they gave themselves to us by the will of God. So this is not talking about your private devotion. The Lord knows that I've given myself to him. Yes, but when you give yourself to the Lord, you and all your substance, you are an offering. A lady said, you know, we so gave and gave and gave. My husband's giving everything in our house. It's just for him to carry me and our children and come and put on the altar. Yes. When you give yourself to the Lord, you can't hold back. And I've often said, I know, I know we're talking about partnership. I've often said the same thing. The reason a lot of people, I mean, the, the, not a lot of people, the reason you have some Christians having problems in marriages is because people who have not given themselves to the Lord are trying to give themselves to each other. So you have, you have a lot of selfishness. So if you are not married and you want to get married, look for the man who has given himself to the Lord. Not the one who was giving himself to the opinions of men or to the traditions of men, but the one that's giving himself to the Lord. Because he will be controlled by his strong passion and love for Christ. That's what drives us. What can I hold back? Don't I know where God took me from? Why should I hold back? Everything that I have, everything that, everything that, that I ever have now or will ever have has come from the Lord. And I'm grateful to our man of God, Pastor Chris, that has taught me the most excellent way and giving us an excellent life through the spirit of God and then has taught me the life of prosperity. So how can I hold back? For what? I belong to the Lord. I'm an offering myself. So why should I hold back? So sons of consolation don't hold back. Hallelujah. So they gave themselves to us by the will of God, he said. Your private, devo your private devotion to the Lord is okay. But we are talking of your substance. When your private devotion is just a private matter, it is not seen in your commitment to the work of the ministry, it is questionable. By the time you're giving yourself to the Lord, it is enlightening for you to give yourself to the ministry. It's enlightening for you to give yourself or to give off anything that is associated with you. Opportunities, resources, privileges, they will naturally follow. So you ask yourself, have I given myself to the Lord? And if you have, no half measures. Hallelujah. A church. Paul was writing to the Corinthians who were full of the Holy Ghost. They had the gifts of the Spirit. I want you to know the grace of God that is upon the churches in Macedonia. 
the grace was in manifestation that the apostle had to commend them and took note of them. God knows I'm a son of consolation. Your works cannot be hidden. They cannot be hidden. I give in my own small way. No, it's not about the size. It's about the timing and it's about how you do it. How you do it. There are some people that say, well, everybody has given. The Bible said they sold lands. Why did this man still go and bring the biggest? He wasn't looking for recognition. He just wanted the work of the apostles to be easier. In our partnership, we're helping to fulfill the mandate. You know what I like in working, in, in, in teaming up together with our man of God, Pastor Chris? We have now found the best opportunity to fulfill God's calling upon our own lives. That's what Pastor has helped us to do. How many of us knew we were called until Pastor let us, let us know that we were called? That's the reason pride should never be in any man's heart. No pride, no arrogance. You were going the other direction. When I met the man of God, I had ambitions. He was patient, very patient with me. I had ambitions. But I knew he was praying for me. He was waiting for me as if when you finish exhausting all the whatever. So one day, God began to deal with me. And he asked me, so after this, what next? After this, what next? After this, what next? It got to a point, I didn't see my future beyond the last question God asked me. I could not answer. I knew what that meant. He showed me that, you see, all your plans end here. So I came to the man of God. I said, I've given up. He said, I've been waiting for you. What took you so long? Praise God. Hallelujah. All right. Let's look at another set of scriptures here. Romans chapter number 16. Romans 16 from, verses, from verse 3, the Amplified Classic. Give my greetings to Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ. Who risked their lives endangering their very necks for my, for my life? To them, not only I, but also all the churches among the Gentiles give thanks. Remember also the church that meets in their house. Greet my beloved Espinatus, um, who is a first fruit, a first convert to Christ in Asia. Now, striking testimony of Paul about these people. He didn't, he didn't just say that they were helpers. Of course they were. But he says, oh, and, and Paul had many, many helpers. But these men, this, this couple, they distinguished themselves and Paul declared that they risked their lives for him. Note, they didn't do this for themselves, but for Paul, he said, who have for my life laid down their own necks. Why? Because they saw Paul as the man of God. They identified with his vision. So they risked their lives to make sure that the gospel given to Paul succeeds. Now, they, they reckon that Paul's vision was worth living for, and if necessary, dying for. Hence, they took the risks. What do you think about the vision God gave to our man of God, Pastor Chris? Think about it. We've said over and over again. If you didn't think of it seriously, from, from March 2020, when the, the fiasco, the pandemic, COVID-19, hit the world, Everybody was running, everybody was hiding, everybody was quiet. Perhaps there were few that would have spoken, but they were afraid. And many compromised by collecting money from the, from the deep state. But a man of God will not keep quiet. Because 
pastor says, I have only one boss. And what is important is what he says. And the whole world have been listening to our man of God, Pastor Chris. Imagine the vision and the mandate. This is what living for. This is what risking our lives for. So we're not here to play games. We're here for real business. Yes. And I thank God for the many, many partners that we have. Many are working and expressing their faith. And the reason for wanting to have more is to do more in the kingdom of God. You know, I always say to myself, you must be relevant at all times. Because God called the man of God, Pastor Chris, he has made provision for the vision. So it is your relevance for yourself that's important. If you don't do it, someone else is doing it. And if you don't know, someone is actually already doing bigger or better. So why would you hesitate? Why wouldn't you do it? Why wouldn't you do it? Because it's in your own interest. Where were you when God called the man of God, Pastor Chris? So I, 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 I said to anyone who say, no, no, I'm, I'm not going to give. The man of God has never asked for anything. We are being part of something divine through our partnership. He's not asked for anything. He doesn't need anything. Where were you when he started? Where were you when he did, when what I said now, I can tell you how many, how many people we had in the church, the whole, the whole church in Lagos. I don't, I'm not too sure at that time if we're up to 300. When pastor went to that church and did that for that man. We understand that you sow, you reap. Imagine what the man of God did at that time. It wasn't your money he sowed. So what you're doing now is in your own interest. Hallelujah. Praise God. So do it and do it with all your heart. Do it with all your heart. So don't be involved in partnership as a matter of convenience. No, don't do it if opportunity or privilege comes to meet you. But do it as a matter of commitment. And if the opportunity comes for you to lay down your life or your neck, you will do it. Won't you? Are you not of that sort? Now, Paul said, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. He said, I'm not the only one that recognizes what they've done, but all the churches of the Gentiles. They may not have known what they did. They may not have known the extent of the impact they made on Paul and his ministry. They may not have known how beneficial they were to the ent entire church. But the Bible testifies of that impact. Hallelujah. Praise God. So we know it is possible for many to repeat the same thing, to have greater testimonies than this. So let your impact extend beyond your church. Let your impact extend beyond your group. Let it extend beyond your zone. The man of God told us that. And be thankful for what God has given you the opportunity to do in your church or your zone. But let it extend because we have a global ministry. And that is our focus. Hallelujah. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 16, Paul the Apostle also testified of the house of Stephanus. How they addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Not the word addicted. They addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Not to their own dreams, not to their own agenda, not to their own desires. When you truly meet the Lord, his ambitions become your ambitions. Yes, 
I say to someone, the word ambition is not wrong, but be ambitious for Christ. Let his ambitions become your ambitions. Now, Paul, in commending them, said, you know the house of Stephanus? You know, meaning you are aware of the house of Stephanus. So Paul is testifying of his house also. And we got, we've had partners here, whole household. Mom is partnering, dad is partnering, children are partnering. That's how my family is. And one of the beautiful things that the man of God, Pastor Chris, has done for me, when he brought the gospel, God lifted me in my family and I took it home. And everybody is involved in the ministry. So prosperous. And we are partners, all of us. There is no one needing help from another one. That's what the gospel can do for your family. But we are partners. We're hearing the same thing. We're inspired. You know, I gave my card. This one to say, okay, I gave this amount of money. We inspired. <laughs> I mean, it's, sometimes the pastor just says, wow, you did that? Me too, I'm, I'm going to. That's what we do. Not you, pastor. Your wife gave seed in church. Trouble started at home. Because he didn't give you the money to send to your grandmother. Maybe I just talked about someone now. Leave her alone. Praise God for her. Say, just say, honey, I just love you because of the way you love the Lord. Hallelujah. So what is your house known for? What is your house known for? In verse 16, he called them helpers and laborers. And, and the term laborers, copiao, is not just a casual term, but it connotes to labor with wearisome effort. That means there's efforts. This is beyond comfort. This is beyond convenience. Laborers and helpers. And such laborers and helpers are required today. We are in a phase. The man of God has already blessed us and prophesied and said to us, we are going to be so prosperous. Because Christ is not coming for a poor church. He's not coming for a sick church. He's not coming for a begging church. We, we are men and women of courage. So every one of us should stand tall. That's where we stand out. That's where we stand out. At the beginning of this year, the man of God told us that there will be other clouds, but it's our cloud that matters. There will be clouds. Of, now there's clouds of inflation. He said there will be clouds of war, but it's our cloud that matters. And as we approach the end of this year, haven't we seen that word come to pass? Yes, no matter what they have said, in spite of what they have said, you will continue to buy, you will continue to do business, you will continue to profit, you will continue to make progress because the Lord has lifted us above the economies of this world. Hallelujah. A son of consolation knows that there's provision for him to do the work of the ministry. So you don't beg. It's just for you in the month of insight. I was so excited because the Lord will open your eyes to show you the path of profit. It's for you just to know where it is. And the money and the job is for a purpose. I said to my brethren, you know, you, you can be tried. The man of God has taught us because you're a partner doesn't mean that the devil will congratulate you. But every time it looks like things are not moving, remember, you are always the victor. The joy and the courage to continue the fight is because we are winners. Because I know I'm a winner, I don't give up. Are you hearing me? So I said, they are not able to hold back your money. So don't, don't repeat, they are holding my money. Holding. They are not able to hold back your resources, wherever it is. Yes, Satan may try. And I ask the question, what are you addicted to? They addicted themselves to the ministry, to the saints. If your neighbors... Your colleagues, your family members were to describe your house. What will they say you are addicted to? Think about it. What will be said that you were addicted to? 
Now, I said, I said to our leaders and our pastors, a leader should be a man of means or a man of faith. As a matter of fact, a man of both. But you see, we say all. Oh, if you don't have the means, your faith will get you the means. If you don't have the faith, your means will do the work. So a leader should be a man of means and a man of faith. So when, when, when we say we're having something of billions to do, you look at what you can do and give according to the level at which God has blessed you and don't confess yourself backward. If you can give him millions, why give him thousands? So we say we're doing something of 10 billion and you know you can give in hundreds of millions. You come up with 50,000. You're not looking at the big picture. A son of consolation, consolation is the one who hears the instruction. He hears the word louder than any other person. He hears in a different way. He's saying God is talking to me and telling me to do it. That's the son of consolation. Praise God. A son of consolation. David was a son of consolation. Because he, he brought comfort. He brought encouragement. He brought help. When his big brothers and the king and the, uh, the, the officers and the armies of Israel were all afraid, David stood out. In fact, we talked about who reached there. These people that Paul just comment, commended. They laid down their necks. David laid down his life. He faced a Goliath. Goliath, who thought that he was going to finish the little boy? So David was the son of consolation. No wonder he raised these men that were dejected. They were indebted in every way. All the bad things about them. They came and joined themselves to David. He raised them up. And guess what? They became sons of consolation. In battle, sons of consolation. In giving, sons of consolation. Because David himself was a son of consolation. Say, I'm a son of consolation. Okay, don't leave it at the level of confession. Let what you do in the church, what you do in the cell, what you do in your group, prove you to be a son of consolation. Our beloved Elder T of blessed memory told us something once. He said, when, he said when we were in the other church, in the men's fellowship, he said the pastor will come up and say, we want benches for the church. He said one particular man in the men's fellowship will stand up and say, pastor, I will do it. Don't worry about that. Daddy said, we will clap for him. Then the, the pastor will say, we need to buy a bus. The same man will say, pastor, I will do it. He said, we'll clap for him. Daddy said, all these years, we thought he was helping us. But we watch him, said, we watch him. He was growing. He was prospering. His business was expanding. He was becoming richer. He said, until one day, he said, I realized that we are cheated ourselves. He was not helping us, he was helping himself. That was very instructive. That was very, I'll never forget that. That was very instructive. Yes, while we are thanking God for what others are doing, where is your own? Where is your own? Where is your own? You can make impact at every level. And where you are right now with what you do with all your heart, do it. And then God will move you to the next level. I remember a, a young guy said he only could pay for three copies of Rhapsody of Realities in the whole year. But the next year, he was paying for 3,000 copies. Only from three copies to 3,000 copies. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say, I'm a son of consolation. Say it again, I'm a son of consolation. I will not be at ease in Zion. I love the Lord. And I love our men of God. And I'm identified with the vision and the mandate that God has given to our man of God. Lift your hands up, everyone.
from this time, look out for what needs to be done and take the big size of it. Decide to do it. Decide to do it here in a different way. Make up for the lack of others. Let it be recorded in heaven that you are a daughter of consolation or a son of consolation. Stick out your neck and do what needs to be done. The vision is big. It's inspiring. Make sure you're part of it. Lift your hands, everyone. Thank God for bringing you here to raise you to that level of super relevance in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Go ahead and thank him.
and sucklings you have brought out strength father thank you father thank you father thank you a tree of forests we're grateful thank you for the workings of your spirit we're grateful we take this bread sanctified as your body thank you for all that your body is all your body represents Father, we thank you for the victories. We thank you. Yes, indeed, we are sons of consolations. Thank you, my Father. In every area of ministry, we are blessings. We are blessings. The seven billion mandate you give our man of God is a reality. We're engaging them. We're engaging them in the strength of your spirit. We're grateful for all the strategies and grateful for the influences of your spirit. Thank you, my Father. Yes, wisdom increases, ability increases, capacity increases, even as we take this communion now, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And every other thing that communion represents is at work in our lives mightily. We give you praise, in Jesus' mighty name. Break it down, it is. In the same manner, Lord, we take the cup, we bless it sanctified as your blood thank you my father for your blessings and your blood and all your blood is your blood signifies divine health your blood is divine health your blood is prosperity your blood is graces and even much more as we drink it they are all at work in our lives mightily in the name of our lord jesus christ
offerings. Father, we thank you for the privilege and honor to give our offerings. We've given in faith and love and the understanding of your word. Father, thank you because the devourer has been book for our sake and we invoke your blessings on every giving and every giver for the essence of multiplication in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Shout hallelujah. Now tomorrow's session is gonna just be powerful. You know we're running off tomorrow morning and evening. Many of us here we're not in the morning session. Ensure you're there tomorrow. Tomorrow's session is 9 a.m. Praise God. Awesome beauty. So much from the IPPC to relieve the moments and be blessed with. Praise God. Hallelujah. And the evening session also will be 5 p.m. tomorrow. But I tell you, it's very, very loaded. Was it loaded today? Oh, what a blessing. What a blessing. You know, some of, these are some messages you can just listen to a hundred times, two hundred times. And um, you just to be on. The more you listen to it. How many of us were in IPC in Lagos? How many of us were there? And of course, you got new revelations again as you listen to these songs of consolation. Yes. Because God's word is never the same. Never the same. There's always something new about God's word. When I you see, there are things that I wrote down now that I didn't write down, but I was in the message. So, God's word is new every morning. The revelation just keeps coming keeps coming, keeps coming, and keeps upgrading. So we're grateful. So be here. It's a great year. The Lord has planned it, the year ahead to be a very great year for you. So you will make it happen as God has planned it. Say thank you, Lord Jesus. Can we stand to our feet now? 9 a.m. is the time tomorrow. We're praying at 10 p.m. today. Please take notes. Our King's Chat Prayers, 10 p.m. And all ladies, the ladies network, you, you're praying at 1 a.m. Are we aware? Yes, 1 a.m. This night. Or tomorrow night. <laughs> this morning. Okay. So, one in, so set your alarm. If you don't set your alarm, you might just sleep off. So set your alarm now if you haven't done that. Pray that prayer. So when things are scheduled like this, they are always for something. So you wake up at 1 a.m. and pray that prayer. You don't know the blessings it will bring to you. You don't know the evil it will drive away. So wake up and pray that prayer. So very important. Hallelujah. Lift your hands towards heaven. We are grateful. We thank you, my Father. We love you. Thank you for the impact of your spirit in our lives we're grateful we're grateful and that impact will be used to bless the world and impact the world in the name of our lord jesus christ and the grace of our lord jesus christ the love of god and the sweet fellowship of the holy spirit is in us now and always surely as we dwell in the word of the lord forever and ever Amen. Can we shout out three foot hallelujah as we close? Hallelujah. Hallelujah.